today's lecture. Uh, today's lecture is for Thursday, and uh, with this lecture, we'll be try. I'll try to keep relatively short, um, as we're just going to talk about Lab Two, uh, a project, and then kind of transition from talking about project man management, uh, Git, and uh, version control systems, um, and move more into software and focus on software, software security. Uh, and clean code. So the the material, basically, you're going to look at the material coming from uh, the book that was required for the course. Um, with this, then, uh, we'll take a look at Lab Two, and it's all going to be based off of Git. This will be probably our last lab based off of Git. Um, for the first one, then, what we're going to do is um, looking at the doing the pull request. So completing the pull request. Uh, so with this one. Um, I ask that you not use the easy button inside of GitHub and not just click the button and do it automatically or have GitHub do it for you automatically. Uh, and actually check out um, the code, follow the command line arguments, or if you have the, the GUI client installed in your system, um, use that to do it locally. Uh, the idea behind the pull request uh, and what really do, does make these a good tool is that um, what I can do then is let's say that you do a pull request and you're ready to merge your branch, your code into the master line. Um, I can look at it locally. I can take a second, I can merge, um, look at your code, merge master into your code, do it all locally on my local repository, uh, and debug it and test it. And it's much easier to kind of revert from those changes or, or not push those commits if those merge commits become, if let's say it introduces a bug or some undesirable effect, um, then I don't have to push those to the remote. And so it's a little bit easier to deal with those. Uh, it gives me the opportunity to test the branch as well. So part of the code review process uh, is that I can actually test the code uh, as the person doing the code review. So you know you can use these as an opportunity with your team or with the other developers to to you know initiate a pull request and have somebody else do it, have somebody else look at it, uh, and then do the code review in tandem or you know do it independently. However you see that person doing it independently, however you see best see fit. Um, for this one then, uh, just to try to make things a little bit easier, uh, I guess I, we can call this an assignment, but um, I'll just have Brent work on Christina's, uh, so he'll do uh, the pull request that Christina submitted. Christina can do the pull request that Alex submitted. Alex can do the pull request that Brent submitted, so that way everybody can do a pull request. Um, with those, uh, I know again it's a little hard to get the full scope of these because we don't actually have, we're not actually have a, a working website or application here. And so the pull request should just contain um, the code for a plugin in the appropriate directory. Um, so, but if you see anything, if you see an issue with one, you know, feel free to leverage the system to leave a comment and you know maybe resolve the issue before completing the merge or the pull request. So, um, if it doesn't look good to you, uh, go ahead and stop it, have it get it fixed, and then complete the request. Um, for part two. I've created a new repository. You guys should have uh, the right access to that. It's called CSC 744 Drupal. Um, there's one file in it, and it's just a one of the core Drupal framework files. And what we need to do is we need to patch it or create a patch um, based off of this line here to fix an SQL injection vulnerability. So if you open up that file, it'll be database.inc. And on line 736, uh, replace that line that's in that file with this line and then generate a patch from it and from there uh, upload the patch to the Dropbox when you submit. Uh, additionally, there's a little blurb here, uh, just read through that and answer, answer the question that I posed here as well. Um, for part three then, I've created a branch, so let's go back to our uh, CSC744 repository, the one that we've mainly been working out here the last week or so. Um, another branch called Lab2 Part 3. Um, and this branch then, uh, we're just gonna try to simulate again that I've created a branch and I was doing some code and some of it was experimental and I, and I got to the end of what I wanted to work on and decided basically that um, the majority of the work on that branch I didn't need. And so from that branch, uh, what command using the cherry pick, what command would you use to just pull the commit that contains what uh, the commit that has the plugin that I added to it. So I think there's three or maybe four commits. One commit has a plugin, the rest of them were just I'm trying to simulate that I was doing some development and contemplating or working on setting up my own custom uh, plugin. So, uh, what command? So you can just type the command out here and, and submit that as part of the document. Uh, and then finally, part four. Okay, so let's again, let's just pretend, uh, trying to simulate something that uh, I've actually dealt with just recently, uh, and that is that let's say that I've accidentally merged um, a, my branch into the master line and pushed that master line to uh, or and then push to the master, push to the remote. Um, and so what's currently on, you'll see lab two part four, 
that branch has been merged to master, um, what could I do? What command would I would I issue to revert that commit so that this this commit hash is no longer on the master line? Okay, so then again, just type in the commands here. Um, if you want to check it out locally and run the commands and test it out yourself and, and put screenshots here, that's fine as well. Um, but I'm really just looking for um, whatever command or commands you would run in order to revert so that the, the head of the master branch does not contain this commit. It doesn't contain anything from that branch from lab two part four. Okay, so if there's anything that's unclear about this, uh, you have any questions, or any ambiguity, please let me know so I can get those uh, addressed. And uh, otherwise, the the Dropbox due date, um, I'll have to double check. I forgot what 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 time what date I set. So, but it'll probably be a week week and a half. So just uh, keep track of that. Um, whenever the Dropbox set to close is when is when it's due. Okay. Um, as for the project, okay, it's going to look. Um, Pretty similar to uh, probably some other projects that you've seen in other coursework here, uh, and that we just want to take a little bit of time and do a little bit of uh, a literature review on application security. And so with this one, um, that's all it's going to be though is just uh, you know a literature review and a little bit of your research in. Um, let me get rid of this piece here. You know, and then a little bit of research in any in, in one particular area. So I'll update this document to reflect that. So um, we're going to move into looking more at that actual coding and coding practices and application security. And so uh, I've uploaded a document to the Dropbox into the content section of learning the top 10 software security design flaws. So you can use that as a document to kind of, you know, as a good starting point. Um, to kind of review the state of the security industry or, or the state of security and software development um, and then any other resource that you want. And so I'm looking for somewhere between you know three to five pages. Um, the first portion of it can just be summarizing you know what is the current state, what are the security, what are the, the current issues and challenges that we're facing uh, as developers or people that manage development team. Uh, and then the second part we can focus in so maybe like the, the other half of the page, a page or two, um, can maybe focus in on a specific area and what you propose to do, what, what you think you could do to solve it or proposals to solve that situation. So um, I'll, I'll update this document here and this is what you'll see in the Dropbox. Um, three to five pages-ish, uh, you know, you can certainly go longer. Um, you can go, you know, on the shorter end there if it's if everything looks, you know, pretty solid. Um, format, so 12 point, use a standard font, Times New Roman or something. Uh, double citing and then just a works cited page, okay? So um, any questions on that, or if you're not really sure uh, the direction that you're headed and you want just to get some verification, please feel free to send me an email. Um, otherwise, you know, application security, that's really what we're looking at. Um, as far as, you know, issues and topics, you know, you can, you can look into, you know, how can we leverage systems like Git and Git flow and hooks and build processes? How can we leverage unit testing? You know, how can we leverage those things to try to ensure that the quality of code that we're putting out is, is better or could be better. Um, the software development life cycle, the, the role of a strong um, you know, software development leader that has a strong focus on security, um, you know, any of those issues are, are fair game. So uh, if you have any questions though, just please let me know and I'd be more than happy to provide any clarity on that. Okay, so I'll get rid of that. Okay, so then the only thing else that I really wanna to cover today um, as the document that I put up there Let's see if I've got that open. I don't think I do. Um, this is the document here. So to go along with, uh, I'll just call it a project, uh, but the, the, the paper, um, avoiding the top 10 software security design flaws. So, you know, it's a 30-some it's a page paper here. Uh, so it might take a few minutes here to read through, but it's all really relevant and good topics. So um, that's one of the reasons we'll keep this short. So use the time that uh, we normally would have had listening to this, um, you know, taking, to, uh, uh, taking a few minutes of reading through this document. Okay, so the last thing then today is I uh, just wanted to talk about not Heartbleed. I have a, I had a Heartbleed demo and I'm utilizing a VM uh, that that's, uh, was used for the Heartbleed demo. But take a look at Shellshock and, oh boy, I upgraded to Yosemite uh, a couple days ago and uh, I'm getting some weird issues every now and again with my graphics. So uh, I'm hoping or waiting, looking forward to that first that first update after Yosemite if it hasn't been pushed out already. So 
um, let's see, so shell shock. What is shell shock? It is a vulnerability. It's a vulnerability in the in software, and it's in that regard, it's a lot like the Heartbleed bug, uh, the Heartbleed vulnerability that we ran across um, a few months ago. It was in, kind of big in the headlines there uh, through mid mid spring or early spring or something here earlier this year. Um, it, it's a vulnerability in the Bash environment, in that um, the way that the way that Bash works, so Bash is the shell, born again shell, and a lot of Linux Unix based systems are going to have the born again shell uh, installed. OS X has the born again shell installed. So every time I open up my Bash editor or the terminal, you know I'm running a Bash. Um, there's a there's a vulnerability though in the way it works. So what we're going to focus on is something called CGI, and some, it's CGI was the or was the ability for a web server to essentially hand off requests to um, something like Bash for processing. So nowadays we have you know pretty strong web-based languages, you know PHP or a .NET or something um, that that handles that handles all the functionality and capability that we need in an application. But uh, we could we could use we could use CGI. We could write a Perl script and then web web requests could be sent to the Perl script and the Perl script could actually generate uh, the content of the response. Uh, in this case, we we can have Bash. We can have Bash do that. And so on this VM here. Get this a little bit larger. Maybe. Okay, there we go. Um, so what we have on this VM then is an Apache web server, uh, the standard Apache web server that came. I think this is a Ubuntu 12.04, um, and I can you can see here. If I can type that I have Apache running. So Apache's run. Um, the other thing that you have to make sure, at least to see the, the vulnerability to create or, or leverage an exploit on that, uh, is that you have, uh, oops, so you have CGI enabled. Okay, so you can see the module CGI is enabled. So uh, the what you can do with an Apache web server is you can configure a variety of modules that expand or extend its functionality. Uh, in this case, we have CGI enabled. Um, when I started this VM, I can't remember because I've had it for a little while if I had to install Apache or if it came installed out of the box, um, but CGI was already enabled, so I didn't actually have to enable that. Um, in order to take advantage of this, though, we have to have a script. And so there is a user lib CGI bin. There is a script I created, poc.cgi. So if we take a look at that. Mission denied. Oh. Okay, you can see here, here's that script. And what's it doing on the first line? Well, it looks like a bash script. It's invoking bash. Um, from there, then, we're just simply echoing content, echoing some HTML, and then printing off the user bin environment. And so this is just return. We're going to request this page like we would through a browser. Um, in fact, I'll do that here in just a second. And this is just returning the basic structure of an HTML page and an HTTP response uh, in order for our browser to understand it and render it. So we can go ahead and we can request that page. Wait. Localhost CGI bin POC.CGI. Okay, and there it is. There's the there's the content returned from that script. Okay, so what is the vulnerability then? Well, the vulnerability comes from where did my browser go? the way that Bash processes functions. Um, when Bash is invoked, it loads its environment. And part of it creating this environment is that it's looking for function definitions and then it's defining functions. So let's see here. You might see if you if you haven't studied the, the vulnerability yet, um, you might see something like this, and somebody's saying, yep, uh, if you run something like this, this weird syntax here, you'll see that you may or may not be vulnerable. Well, what they're doing is, this is just a basic function definition. Okay, there's no function name, but there's the opening and closing bracket, there's the curly brackets, and then there's nothing inside of it. So we're, we're essentially, we're defining a function here, it's just, it just has no name. That invokes, uh, bash though to start interpreting or and defining that function. The problem comes then that it doesn't stop. 
So you'll see here in just a second, then, when we define this function and send it to that script, uh, once it recognizes that there's a function there, it loads it, tries to define it, um, then it continues to execute additional, whatever additional code uh, is on that line. So you have what would be considered a remote code execution. All right, so I have two programs then that we can look at. Um, the first one we'll take a look at is a C program and one that I cobbled together. Um, Okay. If you haven't done any socket programming with C, um, a lot of this code up here at the top is just to set up a raw socket, TCP socket, to connect to a server. Um, and this stuff down here, line 33 and on, uh, that's more of the part of the functionality here in the script that we're worried about. Um, what we're doing is we're, as you can see right here, is once we create a connection, um, we're generating our own HTTP request and sending it to that server to hopefully elicit an HTTP response. Um, HTTP requests, they're just essentially, uh, you start with your git or your post, this percent %s, so we're using a format specifier uh, here in the statement. This will be the URL or the page that we're requesting. We're saying that we're HTTP 1.1. 1, 1 um, after, after each header is sent, you do a carriage return new line, uh, and then starts the next header. Okay, so now from here, we're just key value pair. We're just host, colon, and then the value. So what is the actual domain that we're requesting? Carriage return new line. Content type, application, form URL encoded, carriage return new line. And then here is where we're going to send our payload. So we have an arbitrary header called test, and we're going to have our payload right here. And then we have two, carriage return new line, carriage return new line. So those two indicate to the server that that is the end of the HTTP request. Um, what is this payload going to be? Well, it's going to be this payload string. And so if we take a look at that, here you can see, very similar to that article that we just looked at, uh, there's a function definition. And then, additionally, there is a bunch of arbitrary code that I'm going to send and hopefully get the server to execute. So in this case, it's going to echo content type uh, text plain, and then it's going to echo, I'm assuming those are a couple of new lines, and then we're going to have bin cat at cpasswd. Okay, so we're going to try to cat uh, the contents of that password file. All right, and then the rest of this code then, that's just what, that's, it's just, uh, it's code to send the request. Okay, so write on that socket, send the string value, and then wait, read on that socket, wait for the response, put the response, and then terminate the program. Okay. Okay, I'm going to execute this everything on localhost. All right, so we know the server's running um, on the desktop, and I've already compiled that program. So uh, if everything works here, when I run that C program, then I should see the contents of the passwd file. And sure enough, there they are. Okay, so I just was able to exploit that vulnerability. Okay, that's C. Uh, C can be a little lengthy when it comes to writing things like this. Um, so there's also a Python script, and this one I won't take credit for because I did find uh, a good chunk of this on a paste bin entry. Um, but it does the same thing. Okay, so here we can see, here's our payload almost identical, and then with this one, uh, I'm going to send a slightly different payload after that function definition. Uh, and this is code that tells Bash to create a reverse shell. So what we're going to do is we're going to try to get a reverse shell on the server. Again, everything's running localhost here, um, but you get the idea. Okay, so uh, create a connection. Okay, we're going to use the arguments that we passed uh, based off of how we call the program, so some command line arguments. Um, get the payload, create the headers, there's that test header, so we're just building the, the headers. We don't, we're not, it's not quite the same format because um, Python allows us to do this just a little bit easier. Um, we create the request, get the response, read the response, and then finally print off the data. Okay. So, um, if we want to try to get something to connect back to us though, we're going to have to have a listener running, something for that payload that we're going to send to that server to be able to connect back to. So, for this, I'm going to use netcat, and I'm going to set up a listener with netcat on port 88. Okay, so now this is just, this tab, this shell, is just listening on port 80 for any raw connections to it. Um, from here, okay, we'll actually run that Python script, shellshock.py. Okay. That one has a nice um, usage section, so it'll tell you how to actually invoke the, your call to Python script. So, uh, Python shellshock. We're just working on localhost here, so that's the URL. 
um, the page that we want to create uh, request CGI bin uh, POC.CGI. And then I want it to connect to localhost on port 8080. Okay. So here we go. We'll see what happens. Okay. If that worked, then on this other tab, I should have a shell, in which case I do. So it connected back to me. I am now have a remote shell on that system, www.data. Who am I? Oops. Who am I? Okay, www-data, that's the Apache process. Um, well, I can't kill it here, but uh, I'm not the Apache process here. I'm the heart account. Um, so there we go. I have a reverse shell, and I have all the permissions that the Apache user has, uh, which may or may not be, you know, uh, may or may not be a lot. Let's see. We can still get around still get around the file system. All right, so anyways, that is, uh, that is Shellshock. Pretty brief introduction to it in a quick demo, uh, but that's what it is. So vulnerabilities, these are vulnerabilities in software, and they allow, they allow someone you know, a, a pretty significant ability to exploit the servers that are running that software. Um, and so that's why you know, writing good, clean, secure code becomes critically important. It's really, really hard to do. And you know, no one's ever going to probably write you know, secure code, bug-free code out the door the first shot. Uh, but it's important because you know, things like this, it just seems like such an easy thing. Well, why, would it, why wouldn't it stop processing at, you know, at the end of this function definition so that it, you wouldn't have a bug like that? But it's so hard to think of things like this as you're developing software. And so that's why to, you know, it helps to get you know, go through those code review processes and get other people's, you know, other sets of eyes on it um, because other people can catch things like this. Um, the other thing that, it, that has always been a challenge for me anyway is to think in that security context, to think in that malicious context because I get so focused on building functionality that works um, that I don't always think about the ways that I can exploit it. And so, you know, kind of helping give that perspective to a team and, and give that perspective in the part of a code review process I think is very valuable. But it takes training, it takes time, it takes effort because people have to go through things like this and see demos like this in order to understand you know, what bugs can lead to. Okay? It's not an exploit. The, the exploitation of something like this is us sending a script and actually exploiting it. This is just simply a software vulnerability. It's a bug uh, that has led to something that can be exploited. So. Um, that's really all I have today. So like I said, relatively short. Uh, there is the, the cyber security, the security document that's been uploaded, um, and then the lab two and the project one. So please take a look at those. Uh, if you have any questions on anything, let me know. If anything's not clear, if I made a mistake on anything, let me know so that I can address that and clear it up. Um, otherwise, next week, we will start with the material and the clean code book. So um, take a look at the first couple chapters in that. And uh, we'll keep pressing on. So hope everyone has a great weekend and talk to you next week.